Welcome to this talk on Thea.cloud. My name is Simon Grabant. I'm a software engineer at Eclipse Source. And unfortunately, Maximilian cannot be here today, but I'm joined by uh, Philip Langer to support me. And today I want to talk to you about how you can run your Thea-based products in the cloud from now on. Let's firstly start by talking about our motivation for this topic and the goals that come with it. So the motivation was basically that we wanted to simplify the deployment of Thea-based products as we noticed that this was an issue that often arises at the end of the software project. And then uh, if, it is a, if it is hard to deploy something, then it becomes increasingly annoying. With that, we also defined some goals that we wanted to uh, tackle with this or reach with this. First of all, we want to provide great end user performance because if you can imagine if it's uh, simply uh, or easy to deploy your product, but then it's not really uh, a good fit for end users because the performance is bad, then it's, not just a good, uh, then it's just not a good solution. Also, on the other hand, if you look at it from the uh, perspective of the adopter, uh, we want to minimize the resource usage as uh, the same applies here. Uh, if it would be very costly to run the solution, it's again not a very good solution. And thirdly, a very important point is that we want to flatten the learning curve for new adopters, uh, meaning that we want to keep the entry level relatively low uh, to get started with Thea.cloud. But while we want to reach this goal, we also want to stay extensible and customizable to allow some further use cases uh, that are maybe more uh, hard to do so that you are not hindered by any advanced use cases uh, because it is so easy to use. And with that, I would like to introduce to you Thea.cloud. What is it? It is a framework for hosting web-based tools and IDEs. And some key facts are that it is built on vanilla Kubernetes with only a very thin additional abstraction layer on top of it. This is, of course, due to the goal that I just presented to you, that we, do not want, that we want to keep the entry level relatively easy because Kubernetes is already out there. It's uh, an industry standard, you could say. And uh, even if your developers don't already know about it, there's a lot of good documentation available online that, uh, that they can dig into. Then, like the name indicates, Thea.cloud is focused on Thea-based products. That, this does not mean that you cannot, for example, also host your VS Code-based uh, product with it, but the main, uh, as we noticed that most of our customers are using Thea-based products, the main compatibility and uh, feature development will go towards supporting Thea-based products. Thirdly, we follow a convention over configuration approach, and this can actually be seen from two sides again. So let's start with the user side. So for the user, we do not intend to visit a platform that is hosted by Thea.cloud to go there and create basically their own IDEs that they want to use. So they cannot um, say, I want to use VS Code or Thea, and I want to use that environment uh, or another environment, basically. But they will just come to Thea.cloud and can uh, run the product that is already predefined. And on the other hand, we also want to allow this approach for adopters meaning that they can get relatively easy started with Thea.cloud, like I talked about in the beginning, uh, that we want to flatten the uh, learning curve. And we do that, for example, by providing Helm charts that you can just simply uh, adapt to your likings. So let's say uh, you swap out the image that you want to host, and then you can get uh, started within minutes, basically. And lastly, which ties into the last point of the last slide, is that we also want to provide additional optional functionalities to, uh, with Thea.cloud that you can use, but you don't have to, again, to keep the entry level low, but then get uh, or provide more functionalities for more advanced use cases uh, later on. So let's quickly talk about some of uh, Thea.cloud's uh, Thea main components, starting with the operator, so the Thea.cloud operator. And I will uh, go over what an operator actually is in a few seconds, but first let's discuss what its uh, core role is inside of the Thea.cloud architecture. And that is that it's there to deploy sessions. And we define a session as a running instance of an app for a specific user. Um, so it can end and then another session can be launched later on, for example. And what the operator can do on top of that is he can attach workspaces to those sessions. 
So now it's uh, important to distinguish between those two terminologies, basically. So we, on one hand, we have the sessions, which is the running of the app for a user. And on the other hand, we have the workspace, which is, you could say, the file system. Uh, again, for a user, it could also be shared with other users, but it is uh, uh, acting as uh, the file system and can be attached to certain uh, sessions. So keep that in mind uh, to not confuse those in the, uh, in the next few slides. Then another component that we have is the Thea.cloud service. And uh, this is basically the API for requesting new sessions from the operator. Um, and <clears throat> because it would be relatively boring for a user or not very intuitive to talk to an API when he wants to connect to, a, to an app, uh, we provide a land landing page. And now to make this clear, the main goal of Thea.cloud is that uh, each adopter builds his own a landing page or integrates Thea.cloud in their existing product suite, for example. Uh, but for demo use cases or, again, to get started relatively quickly, we ship two um, example landing pages. One real landing page where, we, where you will be forwarded to an authenticator and can authenticate yourself and then um, the cluster knows which user you are and you will then be forwarded to your pod. And we also have another um, a demo landing page, which we call the Try Now page, where basically no authenticator plays a role, but the user just connects to the Try Now page, accepts some terms of service, and then requests a new pod and gets a new pod without any authentication. And that's a really, really great tool to provide um, demos for uh, tools online, um, or at least that's what we use it for. Uh, so the landing page is basically the UI for the users to request new sessions. And I just quickly talked about that we also have an authenticator, uh, which is used for user management. And now what I want to highlight here is um, that uh, we have also a thing called the Thea.cloud monitor. And what this now is, is that uh, this is one of these additional functionalities that you can install, but you do not have to use. So in this case, it is there to monitor the deployed sessions. Uh, that are running uh, to make sure that the user is still using the pod uh, or if the user is still active. And uh, the monitor can then also shut down pods uh, if the user is no longer active. And this, of course, can save you a lot of money but might be a little bit confusing to start with, so we made it an uh, uh, optional uh, feature, basically, that you can install later on. Now, I promised you that we will talk quickly about what a, a Kubernetes operator actually is. And for that, let's look at the operator pattern. And for that again, um, yeah, I want you to envision you have a human operator that needs to uh, take a look at your cluster and do all the uh, jobs that uh, most of the time are automated uh, by its own manually, and to think about what he uh, actually needs to know about to do this job properly. Uh, so first of all, uh, of course, he needs to have knowledge about the system. So what kind of other services are available that I can connect to, that I can get information from, and so on. I also need to know how I can deploy what. So for a specific session of a specific app, it might be very uh, intensive to run. Uh, then I would need to know how many uh, CPU cores, for example, I need, uh, for example, I need or how, many, uh, how much memory I need to give that pod. And last but not least, it needs to be able to deal with problems. And this is where the Kubernetes operator pattern comes into place. And the goal of it is to automate the above tasks. And it does that by introducing three core concepts. Uh, the first one is a so-called custom, sorry, a custom resource definition. And this is basically a blueprint or a schema for a custom resource, which brings us to the next concept that is introduced that are uh, custom resources. And a custom resource is a file, or like the name say, says, a resource that declaratively defines the target state of a cluster. So it tells the operator on how it thinks the cluster should look like in the end, which brings us to the operator. And its role is to react to those custom resources and update the cluster to match uh, the, the, the real state of the cluster with the one described in the custom resources. And now let's, uh, to further understand it, let's look at uh, the role of these three concepts inside of Thea.cloud in a simplified example. So here you can see what uh, we have deployed on our imaginary cluster. 
starting in the middle with the fiat.cloud operator, which is deployed. And on the left side, you can see that we already defined a custom resource definition for a session. So this tells the cluster how a custom resource for a session should look like. In this case, we need to provide a name for the session. Uh, we need to provide a workspace that we want to work on, the app definition that we want to use, and a user that is using this session. And now let's say after some time, a, a new custom resource is created. This custom resource follows the custom resource definition on the left, uh, hence the arrow. And um, in this case, for this custom resource, uh, the name is John's session. It wants to work on workspaces slash John, wants to use the C++ tool, and the name of the user is John Doe. Now, remember what we talked about before. The operator now tries to match the state of the cluster with the state described in the custom resources. So he will notice that a new custom resource is created, will go to the cluster, and uh, will uh, create a pod for this session. A pod is, um, simplified said, um, the representation of a session on Kubernetes. So it contains everything that uh, we need to run our application. So in this case, a container the, for the C++ tool, and that container needs to have access to the workspace that we just defined in the custom resources, uh, resource, namely the workspaces slash John directory. And now that this pod is available, the operator has done its job and um, can wait for further inputs. And let's uh, just to quickly repeat that, if another session custom resource is created, uh, and this is by another user, uh, namely Jane Doe, she wants to use another tool and another workspace, the operator will again pick that up and create a pod accordingly as well. And now we quickly also talked about that it, uh, that it needs to be able to deal with problems. So let's say for whatever reason, we don't know why, the session custom resource of uh, John's session is deleted or is removed or uh, is not found anymore. The operator will again do its job, will go to the pod that it provisioned because it has had this cu uh, custom resource and will also delete it. And then once they are both uh, removed, we again matched um, the cluster uh, the, the, the real cluster state again with the one defined by the custom resources. And this is, of course, not all that is happening in thea.cloud. That's why I will now go over the, the whole architecture, basically, and not just the, uh, what the operator does, but how all of the pieces in thea.cloud play together. Uh, so again, here you can see what we already have deployed in our uh, imaginary cluster. So uh, we have the landing page deployed. We have an authenticator deployed. Um, the thea.cloud service is running and the thea.cloud operator is already running. And now maybe if you think back and remember that I talked about, uh, about you before that we don't want the users to define how their apps should look like, but we want this to be pre-configured by an admin or something. Um, the first step that now happens, even before any, co uh, any user connects to our cluster or something else, um, a admin or someone else will create a app definition custom resource. So as you might notice now, we will no, uh, now no longer be only talking about one type of custom resource, but now we actually have three, and this will all show you how they all um, play together in the end. And the app definition custom resource, uh, which follows, of course, an app definition custom resource definition, um, provides, most importantly for our use case that we want to demonstrate now, three attributes mainly a, a name for the app, an image that, the, um, that uh, has an, uh, so a container image for that uh, application that we want to run, and also additional stuff like ports that need to be exposed and so on. And with that, the cluster now knows about which apps it can uh, basically provide pods for. And now we come to the point where a user will connect to the landing page. And the first thing that will happen is he will be forwarded to the authenticator. And uh, when the authentication, of course, is successful, the authenticator will return a token. And with this token, the landing page can now go to the thea.cloud service and request a new session like we talked about before. Um, the thea.cloud service, of course, will again check if this token is actually uh, valid to avoid someone else randomly connecting to the service and creating pods on their own. And once this is successful, 
the Theater Cloud service will now create the third custom resource that we will talk about, and that is a custom resource for the workspace. And what it provides is it will provide a name for the workspace, um, the user that is using the workspace at the moment, and some storage option. Uh, this can of, course be, uh, can, of course, differ from uh, cloud provider uh, to a cloud provider, but for now, let's say there is some information about the storage stored here. And similar to how it worked for the session custom resource on the earlier slide, uh, the operator will now pick that up again and will create the persistent volume according to the information uh, in the workspace custom resource. Now note, this could of course already be there from an earlier session, but let's now just say it is a completely new user and he gets a completely new workspace. And once this is created, the Thea.cloud service will now create the session custom resource that we talked about before. So it contains a name for the session and these workspace and app definition fields. On the previous slide, I simplified things a bit by um, putting there a name for the app definition and a path for the workspace. This is now, uh, of course, not true anymore, but uh, rather than that, we will reference the app definition that we created previously and the workspace that we just now created and reference them via their name so that all of the information uh, is transferred this way into the session custom resource. And now, if the uh, and we uh, and the session, of course, also has a user associated with him, uh, with it, and a URL field that is for now empty, and we fill it out later once we know where the session is actually hosted. So now, like on the previous slide, the theater cloud operator will react on that session, and will now actually claim the uh, workspace that we just created or the persistent volume that we just created according to the workspace, and with that, it is able to now. Uh, create the pod that will run our session. So you can see that there are two things in there, a reverse proxy for once, uh, which we will focus on later, and uh, the Thea application that is basically defined in the app definition from the beginning. And now that it hosted this pod, uh, this pod or created it, it will know where the URL, under which URL the pod is available and will put this information into the session custom resource and uh, basically writing it there. And uh, the Thea.cloud service in the meantime waited for this information to be updated. So he will now know, can read out this URL and uh, send it back to the landing page. So in the meantime now, the landing page has, uh, dis has been displaying a loading indicator of some sort. And uh, now that it gets the URL, it can um, connect us to the URL, which is the URL of the pod that we just created. And now we could say, okay, now we have access to the pod, we are in our application, everything is fine, but we still have this reverse proxy topic. And this means uh, that we will authenticate the user one more time to avoid random people just guessing the URL of our pod and connecting to it. And once this is successful, we are now in our Thea application that we um, requested, and we have access to the persistent volume that was created. And so why it is cool to see this all on a, on a slide, I wanted to show you this in a demo. Unfortunately, I have some network issues here, hence I pre-recorded it and will show you that now. Um, so where we are now is we are in the uh, or we were some time ago when I recorded it, we were in the uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, dashboard. And we can use that to show everything that is happening in Thea.cloud because of the fact that we are using very vanilla Kubernetes and not some big abstraction on top of it. So everything that's happening can be displayed in here. And now to give you a quick overview, uh, we are currently looking at all the deployments that are on our cluster. And as you, imagine, uh, as you uh, might remember, on the previous slide it was four. Here it's only three because the authenticator is running in another namespace and we don't want to focus on that now. So we have the three deployments here, the landing page, the operator, and the service deployment. And uh, if we now go to the custom resource definitions tab, we will also see that we have the three, uh, that we have uh, custom resource definition files for the three uh, custom resources that we just talked about. So namely app definition, session, and workspace. And if we now look into the 
um, custom resource definitions of app definition. Uh, you can see here that the one is already existing. This is, of course, again, was created beforehand so that we know what app we can run. And if we look into it, we will see here that we have, uh, sorry, that we have um, a, a image name in the fifth row that you can see here, and that is mainly the image that we want to run in this container, and we also have additional information like a name or CPU and memory limits, uh, and we can also provide a fixed timeout after how many minutes the pod will automatically shut down. Now to quickly look at the other custom resource definitions that we have, so let's look into the session. Um, there is of course nothing here yet because we did not uh, request a session yet. And uh, for the workspace it is the same because we, we have no session that would have created a uh, workspace basically. So now an interesting thing, we can look at the ingresses here uh, for the deployments, and ingress is basically some routing information of the cluster to, uh, to simply uh, simplify it. And if we look at the landing page ingress, we will see here the URL where we need to connect to have access to the, land or to access the landing page. And if we would now connect to that page, we would be immediately forwarded to the authenticator. Um, and if we would put in our very secure username and password and press sign in, we would be forwarded or would be uh, moved back to uh, the landing page and it will display, please wait, uh, we launch your pod. Um, and after some time it will uh, stop, uh, uh, stop loading and forward us. And because it would be relatively boring and I could not show you, uh, so, so you could not get a feeling on how fast this actually is. Um, I will uh, show you this in another way. Uh, so I talked about, uh, so th this just now was the landing page I talked about before with the authenticator connected to it. But we actually, if you go to thea-ide.org, we have this try online button here, which when the, that is fine, which it is right now it seems, will forward you to this try now page for launching a new Thea blueprint. And like I said before, you can accept the terms of conditions and then um, uh, launch a new Thea blueprint. And this is basically the loading indicator. So now you can get a feel for how long this takes. So as you can see, it's already finished. Now note, this is of course dependent on whether or not the image was already pulled for the container. Uh, of course, for the first time when you launch it, it will take a bit, little bit longer because it needs to pull uh, the image or if there's an update to the image. And then you are basically in, a, in Thea running in the cloud and can do all the stuff uh, that you could do in a, um, a Thea blueprint if you would have downloaded it as a, a desktop tool, basically. Um, yeah, so this is not the topic of this talk um, to see what you can do in here. So let's quickly go back to the... Uh, demo, because what is interesting, so here is then, I'm connected now to the, uh, to the Eclipse, uh, to the Eclipse Thea uh, uh, application, and now what actually is interesting is what happened in the back end, so on Kubernetes level. Um, so the first thing that you will see is that we now have an additional deployment to the three that we have before, and this is the deployment of the pod that we, that Thea.cloud has created. And to check that it was created by uh, Thea.cloud and not by anything else, we can go to the custom resource definitions and now uh, look again into the session tab and we see now, okay, a new session, uh, sorry, a new session was actually created. And if we look into that, uh, we have again here some information about it, uh, namely, we now referencing the app definition that I showed you earlier, so it was called Thea Cloud Demo, and now we reference that basically via its name. Um, this uh, session again has its own name, uh, and we have uh, here the, uh, I did not uh, highlight that, but we have the URL where the pod is available in here as well, and the user information and a link to the workspace. So if we go back to the custom resources and into the workspace, we see that the workspace was also properly created and uh, we can see in here all the information that it contains. So um, again, it's referencing the, let, uh, the last app definition that it was referring to uh, or that, was, uh, that it was connected to. Um, 
you again have a name and you have some storage information like I talked about before. And this is a link to a persistent volume claim because I showed you before that uh, we claim the persistent volume and so it basically links to this uh, persistent volume claim that was uh, created as well uh, by Thea.cloud. Now with that, let's end the demo and go back to the slides. Uh, so to summarize, uh, Thea.cloud is a minimalistic framework for deploying Thea-based apps. The key facts are that we are using vanilla Kubernetes. Uh, it is still highly extensible um, and we aim to only uh, in, uh, introduce minimal runtime overhead to uh, save costs for possible adopters. And uh, this is now the good part that my demo, my initial demo does not work. Um, so I wanted to show you that you can try it yourself, which I already showed you, but of course, feel free to try it out yourself to get a feeling of how it works. Uh, so just go to thea-ide.org and use the try online button. And for more information, you can go to thea-cloud.io. So there's one more thing I want to talk about, and uh, that is why well, we now talked a lot about um, functional requirements of Thea or uh, functionalities that it provides, or Thea.cloud, sorry. Um, there's uh, obviously also a lot of non-functional requirements that come with uh, doing a deployment job, basically. And this is where we think the main advantage of Thea.cloud comes into place, because as it is an open source tool, it can uh, help you to leverage uh, the collective intelligence by using Thea.cloud as opposed to everyone um, doing their own uh, deployment solution for Thea-based apps. Now, um, just to highlight some of the key points of these non-functional requirements that exist, of course, it's not limited to this list, but those are maybe the most important ones. So first, how, uh, how it is about security of your cluster. Um, what can you do to uh, prevent misuse of the cluster? Uh, resource management, I already talked about that. Um, you probably want to save resources to also save money in the long run. Then uh, this ties a little bit in with the first three points. So um, how can you monitor what is going on on your cluster right now to take action into stuff that is already happening? Or if something has happened in the past, how can you make sure that it does not happen again? Um, this is, of course, a little bit, uh, so monitoring is uh, for the, when something already happened or is about to happen. Then, of course, you also want to prevent that something is happening in the first place. And therefore, what, you, uh, what are the requirements for testing and also for fault tolerance? So, for example, what happens if a pod randomly dies? What uh, can you do to keep your cluster running and that it's not a weird uh, um, a behavior for the user that he cannot do anything with some random error codes, for example. Um, and with that, in any case, um, whether you choose to use uh, Thea.cloud or not in the future, I want to give you one piece of advice that you should take from this uh, talk, and this is uh, that you should consider deployment from day one of your development and not handle, as a, handle it as an afterthought in the end. Um, because you will run into, into problems at some point or run into this topic at some points. And with that, uh, just a quick reminder that you can evaluate sessions here and you can also uh, evaluate this session. Uh, the rating is, of course, up to you. Um, don't let you distract from that. And uh, we also have some other talks uh, by our company here at Eclipse Source, but uh, unfortunately, they are all in the past already. So maybe you can check out the recording afterwards. And if you have any questions, uh, we have a few more minutes, I believe, so you can ask them now or you visit us at our booth, which is booth nine outside. So thank you for your attention. And I already see there are some questions. So I believe you were the first one to raise the hand. OK, thanks. Um, question from what I know, it's not so much. Yeah. Possibilities. But there is another project which looks to me it seems quite comparable and overlapping from what I understand, which is the use J. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I know, the use also allows you to use the XDA as content for the user, so you are not you are forced to use the GWT distribution paper for the team. So I want to understand why, I mean, what other overlapping is, I mean, why do we have two solutions in science? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so the question was basically what is the difference to Eclipse J? Yeah. Um, and I actually pre prepared a backup slide for this because we expected this question. Um, <laughs> So, uh, first of all, like I talked about in the beginning, so J is more focused uh, for an uh, end user customizable product. So, they want their users to customize apps on their platform, uh, or at least it is a possibility. Um, versus on Thea.cloud, you get a fully pre configured product with none to very little adjustments that you can make um, to your application. Um, then, uh, we have the point that uh, Eclipse J um, is, of course, supporting multiple IDE platforms that you can choose from. And uh, this, of course, plays a role in what the framework overall supports. And uh, whereas this solution is not purely, uh, but main, so the main development focus will go into Thea-based products, basically. So uh, from if there are no uh, requirements, we will not provide any features so that it's easier to deploy a VS Code app, for example. And uh, then another example maybe is also that um, uh, Che will, uh, will uh, most of the time, or at least the times I've saw it, will offer many different products, even if they are pre-configured. Uh, so if this is a possibility, it, there will be multiple products that you can choose from, even if you can't configure them versus on Thea.cloud, our goal is to only provide one or maybe just a few uh, products at the, uh, at the same time. And then, of course, uh, which summarizes all of these points, uh, so Che is uh, uh, quite a, uh, a much bigger abstraction on top of Kubernetes because it offers all of these features versus we really just run on vanilla Kubernetes and just want to simplify the uh, process. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Can I ask a question on top of that one? Yeah, sure. Not having in mind, but how much work would it have been to do a uh, try it now by using shape? Uh, I, uh, haven't, I haven't tried it. Sorry? Compared to the Helm script that you need to do for this. Oh, yeah. Uh, I haven't uh, tried it. Maybe Philip uh, has experience with that. Sorry, uh, the question was how much uh, effort it would have been to do a try now button using Che as opposed to Thea.cloud. To make this more realistic. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's very hard to say because we didn't exactly do the same exercise with Che, so it's hard to compare. Just from, from comparing it uh, maybe on a more abstract level, I think um, the main difference comes not only from how long does it take, but how steep is the learning curve. And here, I think the difference is uh, pretty clear because JDAS offers so much more functionality, which for use cases like the Try Now button, uh, or, or for use cases where, uh, as an adopter of Thea, you just want a simple way to, um, f for your users to, uh, to use your specific app. Uh, it's a huge difference because you don't need all these features that she uh, would provide and um, therefore you don't need to uh, yeah, deal with the complexity uh, with she but you have to in order to use she right uh, and with uh, Thea.cloud this is really the goal to keep this entry point as low as possible uh, in terms of effort and you basically just need to provide uh, to yeah, provide what is the image that you want to load for your users uh, which is your custom app and the rest is already there um, so that's the Difference. I can't tell you it in terms of numbers, but maybe that helps a little bit to scale it, I think. Uh, so I think we reached the 35 minute time limit, but of course I will answer all of your questions if you just come to me now or outside at the booth. Um, so thanks again for your attention and have a nice evening. <laughs>